All of us who know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, Father, we do have reason to give thanks. And Father, it's my prayer that this morning when we open our Bibles and as we join David in his prayer of confession and forgiveness, but seeking renewal and a renewed relationship with you, Father, I pray that in about 30 minutes, when we're giving our invitation, Father, that we will, of all people, be a people giving thanks. Lord, I do pray for our nation. I pray, God, that you'll give our leaders wisdom as they deal with issues of terrorism around the world and even in our own nation. Father, I pray for this pastor in Indiana or Illinois. I'm not sure where. But Father, I cannot imagine going home and discovering that my pregnant wife had been murdered and our son, 15 month old, was upstairs alone in the crib. Father, I can't imagine the tragedy and the traumas that so many people are going through. Lord, I pray for my friend J.W. and for Darlene. I pray for Ellis. And Father, it's times like this that we are reminded that the church is the body of Christ. That, Father, we are different. We are different people with different mindsets, different ways and different thoughts and different attitudes and different actions. But, Father, what it all boils down to is that we are the body of Christ, sinners saved by the grace of God. And we come together as one to say to our friends in trouble that we are here to help you. But we also come together as one to say to the citizens of Paris, you're right, you don't need religion. You need Jesus. They need the light of the world. So the city of lights definitely needs the light of the world. I would pray for my friend, Francis, who teaches at a Bible college in Paris, that you'll give him wisdom as he tries to explain to the culture of Paris what has happened and how Jesus can make a difference. Lord, I pray today for our church. I pray, God, today that as we open our Bibles, we will see that we are to be the hope and the light of the world. And, Father, as the hope and the light of the world, that is my prayer, God Almighty, that today you'll encourage us to be a grateful people as we walk out of here with the hope of Jesus Christ. Now, Father, David had a need a need that we all have. And as we open our Bibles, I'm going to ask you to open our hearts and open our minds that today we too, we too might walk out of here with a restored relationship with you. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, today I do want to continue our series, Gratitude and Glory. And today we're going to be speaking specifically about thanks to God the Holy Spirit. My text this morning is Psalms 51, verses 10 to 12. And I'd like for you to join me, if you would, in uh, saying our theme verse for November. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Let's say it together. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. All right, now that was pitiful. So we're going to do it again. We're going to do it again. Are you ready? Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. Was that very good? All right, we're going to do it one more time. John, you've got that section. Gary, you've got this section. Come on, come on, come on. And I'll take the middle. All right, on the count of three. We're going to do it, and we're going to do it from our hearts. Are you ready? One, two, three, go. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and praise his name. Good. 
All right, now, sometimes it's hard to give thanks, isn't it? I would imagine that it was hard for Susan Lugelli to give thanks. Susan and her husband and their daughter were on vacation. They were driving their motor home, and they were involved in an accident. All of a sudden, in this accident, the motorhome burst into flames. Dark smoke was billowing out of the motorhome. And Susan Lou Kelly said, I could see and I could feel the flesh melting off of my body. In the hospital emergency room, Susan said, I could hear my daughter screaming, where's my mother, where's my mother? And I couldn't get to her because of my birth. And Susan Lugelli said, all I could think of was praising God. And I thought to myself, how is that possible? I really wanted to know the rest of Susan's story. I hope you want to hear the rest of her story, because today we're going to discover the rest of her story. But before we do that, I need to remind you of the context in which we find ourselves today. The Bible tells us in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, King David was sending his soldiers out to war. And while he was sending his soldiers out to war, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. And he was womanizing. David had an affair with Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And David not only had an affair with her, but David had it arranged for Uriah the Hittite to be murdered. And God sent the prophet Nathan to David. And here's what we find. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. It broke God's heart. God was grieved. The Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 9, Why did you despise the word of the Lord, doing what is evil in his eyes? The Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 10, Now therefore the sword will never depart from your house, because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. God says, you despise my word, and you despise me. If we despise God's word, we are despising God. So always remember, for those people who say to you, I love God, but those people do not obey God's word, it doesn't connect. Because God says, if you despise me, you're despising my word. And then the Bible says, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 14, But because by doing this you have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt, Nathan said, You have caused my enemies to show contempt or scorn whenever you and I profess to believe one thing, and go out and live a different way. We are giving the enemies of God an opportunity to show contempt or scorn for God's word. Because, because of his action, King David deserved death. Here's what the Bible says, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death. Numbers 35, 31 says, Do not accept a ransom for the life of a murderer who deserves to die. He must surely be put to death. King David deserves death. And King David had two, two very great needs. He needed forgiveness. And he needed a restoration of his relationship with God. And so if you would take your Bibles and in Psalms 51... Let me remind you why David needs forgiveness. The Bible says in Psalms 51, verses 1 and 2, Have mercy on me, O God. 
And if you read Psalms 51, the superscription says that this is written by David after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba. This is the prayer of his heart. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all of my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. King David said, God, I have committed transgression. A transgression is crossing a forbidden boundary. God had a boundary. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. David crossed that boundary. Oh God, my transgression. David had iniquity. We looked at that last week. Iniquity means our sin nature. He says in verse 5, I was born in iniquity. I was born with a sin nature. Evil comes out of an evil nature. Sin comes out of a sinful heart. King David says, look, I'm a sinner by choice. I made that transgression. I chose to cross that forbidden boundary. But I'm also a sinner by nature. I was born a sinner. And then he said in verse 2, he says about his sin. Sin literally means to miss the mark. If you and I were out and we were shooting arrows with a bow, and our arrow fell short of the target, that's what sin is, falling short. If we hit the target but we missed the bullseye, that's what sin is. Sin is a falling short, is a missing the target. David had a target from God. I want you to be perfect. That's what God said to all of us. Be perfect as I am perfect. Be holy as I am holy. God said, don't commit adultery. Don't commit murder. David missed the target. He fell short. And David realized his sinfulness. And he realized he desperately needed forgiveness. So he cries out, oh God, I need your mercy. Mercy is a supernatural love. It is the love of a superior reaching down to an inferior. God, I need your supernatural love. He needed God's unfailing love. We talked about that last week. Unfailing love is the Hebrew hesed. And it means eternal love. God, I sin. But God, I know I'm going to sin again. And I need your mercy not only on this occasion, but I need your mercy to continue on through my life and through eternity. Because I have iniquity. And then David said, because of my sin, God, I need your great compassion. Now in the King James Version of the Bible, it says, the multitude of thy tender mercies. That word great means abundance. I need your abundant compassion. If mercy is a supernatural love, and if unfailing love is an eternal love, compassion is a practical love. The word compassion is the same word in Hebrew for the womb. The womb. I want you to think of a mother who is pregnant. Does she not guard that womb? Of course she does. Does she not have great care in what she puts into her body, knowing that that is feeding that child? It is the practical love of a mother, guarding, caring for that child in the womb. King David says, God, I need forgiveness. I need supernatural love. I need unfailing love. God, I need desperately your practical love. All of us need forgiveness, don't we? We're sinners and we need forgiveness. How do we find forgiveness? King David said he knew that forgiveness was through the blood. You and I find forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Let me share with you what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might be made the righteousness of God. Isaiah 53, 6 says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned 
to our own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. The truth is that all of us need forgiveness. We need the hope of the gospel. The gospel says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. What is the gift of God? The gift of God is that God sent his son Jesus to a place called Calvary, a cross. And on that cross, God took my sins and your sins and the sins of David. And he placed them on Jesus, as Isaiah 53, 6 and 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says. He took our sins and he placed them on Jesus. And he took Jesus' righteousness and placed it on us if, if we're willing to do that. So the Bible says, as many as received him to them, he gives the authority to become a child of God. The Bible says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him. So the gift of God is this great transaction where God Almighty is willing to say, look, you're a sinner, and I'm willing to place my, your sins on my son. And I'm willing to take my son's righteousness and put it on you. And I'm willing to look at you as a righteous person, a perfect person. It is a gift I will give you, but it is a gift you must receive. Everybody needs forgiveness. And God is willing to forgive you today. If you're not a Christian, I would hope that today... In about 15 minutes when we stand and sing a hymn of invitation, I would hope that you would come and say, take my hand and say, Pastor, Pastor, I need forgiveness. I need to know the hope of the gospel. But forgiveness isn't the only thing that David needed. And so if you take your Bible and look at Psalms 51.10, King David needed a renewal. He needed a restored relationship with God. So he says in Psalms 51, 10 to 12, Create in me a pure, a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing or a free spirit to sustain me. Susan Lugelli was in the emergency room of a hospital. She was getting ready to be transferred to a burn unit three hours away. And she said, as she sat there getting ready to be placed in that helicopter with the whirl of the noise of those helicopter blades, there is one thing and only one thing she could think of. Give thanks with a grateful heart. The song that we sang just before the prayer altar. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Susan Lugelli was burned over 48% of her body. Her back was broken. Susan Lugelli's daughter was thrown through the windshield of the motorhome. Multiple broken bones. Susan Lugelli's husband was burned over 68% of his body. He had 15 fractures in his head. And he had a 9% survival rate. <laughs> and she said, all I could think of was give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks for what He has done. How in the world is that possible? I wanted to know the rest of the story. King David said he desperately needed renewal. Now the reason verses 10 through 12 are so important, because this is a proof to you and to me that King David took sin seriously. We live in a world that trivializes sin. King David did it. He said, God, I'm a sinner. I know I'm forgiven. But now what I desperately need is renewal. So he says in verse 10, create within me a clean heart. I want you to look at that word create. It's an interesting word. It's found in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word create 
means to create out of nothing. Now, you all know my artistic ability is right up there with my singing ability. And I could tell you that I could reach into this bottle of Play-Doh and I could create something this morning. I could create something. You might not know what it is, but I could create it. The word create, bara, is never, never, never used in the sense of creating out of a material object. Never is matter connected with this word bara. It means to create out of nothing. Only God can do this. This is a supernatural word. And David is in essence saying, God, I need a miracle. I need you to create a new heart, a clean heart. It is a miracle that only God can do. I need a new heart. And I need a heart that is clean, that is pure, because I have polluted my heart, because I have transgressed your law. He says, God, I need a renewed spirit. Renew means to repair. I need my spirit repaired. And it needs to be a steadfast or a right spirit. Why does David say that? Because David knew what his son Solomon would later write in Proverbs 4.23. That the issue is always the human heart. Solomon said, above all things, keep your heart. For out of it is the wellspring of life. David's heart said, I prefer lust and adultery with Bathsheba to my love for God. I will cross the boundary. And in his heart, he chose lust and adultery over God. But then, David had a will, a spirit. He said, create in me a clean heart and renew, repair a steadfast spirit. He needed his spirit repaired because his spirit, his will was willing to say, yes, let's go commit adultery. You can have something in your heart, but not do it. David did it. He said, so I need my spirit to be repaired. I need my spirit to be right. Because my spirit chose not to be right. It chose to violate your word. I need my spirit to be right with you. And then he says about removal. Do not cast me from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Cast means to be throw out. Don't throw me out, God. Why would he say that? Because his predecessor, predecessor King Saul, had violated God's word. And he lost his kingship. David says, oh, God, I don't want to lose my ministry, my opportunity to be of service to you. He says, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Why would he say that? Because David was a desperate man. Here's what David did. King David, with all of his accomplishments in life, he's the one that killed Goliath. King David thought he could walk out into this world and he could handle life on his own. He could do it. He was David. He was the man after God's own heart. And when he walked out and he began to live the life in the flesh and do what he could do, when he rejected the Word of God and the Spirit of God, don't you think God's Spirit said, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Don't you think the Word of God came to his mind, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not commit murder? He didn't listen to the Word of God, he didn't listen to the Spirit of God. And King David is a desperate man and he's saying, oh God, God, I've been living my life in the flesh. God, I have not submitted to your word. I have not listened to your Holy Spirit. God, I've been messed out of things. This is a prayer of a desperate man, needing, desperately needing. Me. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. No, I beat my body and make it my slave 
so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the promise. You know what King David is saying? He's saying, look, I don't want to lose my ministry. And the Apostle Paul is saying, look, I know that I can preach to others, but I can be disqualified for the ministry if I don't obey your word. He says, please God, don't remove your presence from me. Don't remove me from ministry. Did you know that every morning and every evening for two hours, they removed the bandages from Susan McGowan. She said it was such intense pain every morning, every evening for two hours. Do you know what they played in that hospital room when those bandages were being removed? Give thanks with a grateful heart. Did you know, did you know that she sang with tears coming down her eyes because of the pain? Did you know that the nurses joined in and they sang? How in the world can you do that? Give thanks in such a situation. King David said, look God, restore to me the joy of your salvation. God, restore to me. I need the joy back. See, this is what sin had cost King David. Sin costs a lot. And one of the things it cost him was his relationship with God. All the joy was gone. He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant, uphold, says the King James Version, me a willing spirit to sustain me. Grant me, uphold me, prop me up, he's saying with a willing or a free spirit. What does that mean? The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans. Romans 8, there it is. My tab got missed. There it is. Romans 8, 14. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, all the Father. David says, God, grant me, grant me a free spirit, a willing spirit. In other words, God, when your spirit spoke to me and said, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, I violated your spirit. I violated your word. God, I want a spirit that is sensitive to your spirit so that when you say don't do it, I won't do it. King David needed forgiveness. King David needed renewal. And every single one of us who take sin seriously need exactly the same thing. And that is why the words of the Apostle John in 1 John 1, 9 are so important. Let's say it together. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. David needed forgiveness. David needed a restoration of his relationship with God. He took his sin seriously. And after all of that, the result was that David said, God, I need you to please use me. And so he starts in verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your way, and sinners will turn back to you. God, here's what I would like to do. I'd like to teach sinners. I'd like to teach them that when you violate God's word and you don't listen to God's spirit, there are consequences to your sin. God, I want to teach them but God, I also want to teach them that they can turn back to you. You've allowed me to come back. You've restored me, God. I want to be used of you to restore others. He said in verse 14, God, here's what I'm going to do. Save me from blood guilt, O God. The God who saves me. Oh, my tongue will sing of your righteousness. You see that word sing? It's a verb. You know what it means? It means to creak. Creak. 
all of us can creep, can't we? It's just emitting a sound. I can creep for you, God. I can sing for you. I will do something with my voice and sing to you. But then, interestingly enough, in verse 15 he says, O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Sing as a verb, praise as a noun. How fascinating is that? He says, I can creep, but then he says, I want to be a praise. I want to walk out of this building a hallelujah because the word praise comes from hallelujah. That's what I want to be. Isn't that what we want to be? We want to be, as we walk out of this building, a hallelujah. We want to be. We don't want to just sing. We don't want to just creep. We want to be a hallelujah. That's what David is saying. And then he says, God, I'm going to sacrifice. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh, God, you will not despise. God, I want to come to you with a broken heart, a broken spirit, because I, God, have failed you. I sin, and I'm taking this sin seriously. Isn't it interesting? You could not bring to God a broken animal. But God requires of us that we bring him a broken heart. David said, God, I bring to you a broken heart. Isn't it interesting that the Bible says, Oh God, you will not despise. And yet that's exactly what David had done, didn't he? He despised God's word, therefore he had despised God. He says, you know, God, I treated you with the same, but I know if I come to you with a broken heart, a broken spirit, God, I know that you won't despise me. So what are the connector points for you and for me? How do we walk out of here and this message is actually applied to our lives? Well, let me ask you, are you really grateful for God's mercy, for God's unfailing love and His great compassion? Are we really grateful? If we are grateful, how do we prove or show our gratitude? One of the ways we would show our gratitude is by not trivializing sin. Romans 6, 1 and 2 says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means! We died to sin, how can we live in it any longer? If you and I looked at sin and saw sin as that which nailed Jesus Christ to the cross, wouldn't gratitude be, I'm going to stop sinning and not be, well, let's go ahead and sin and then ask God for forgiveness, which would be the display of gratitude. King David showed great humility in verses 10 through 12. And isn't humility what God requires of you and me? This is what the Bible says in the book of Micah, chapter 6, verse 8. He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Will you walk humbly with God? Will you walk out of here a humble person? A broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart? Will you say, oh God, please. Forgive me of my sin. Would you walk out of here choosing to be obedient? David said in verses 13 to 17, I'm going to obey you, God. I'm going to teach. I'm going to sing. I'm going to be a hallelujah. I'm going to humbly come before you and ask, God, with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, God, what is it that you would have me to do in restoring me to my ministry? Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 21, Whoever has my commandments and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. How would you say that you display your gratitude? And then my second connector point is this. Do you need a miracle? Do you need a miracle? Psalm 51.10, he says, Create in me a new heart, a clean heart. Create out of nothing. 
God is the God of miracles. Do you need a miracle in your home, in your family, in your marriage, in your life? Do you need a miracle? God is the God of miracles. Go to Him. Thirdly, I would ask, are you repentant? Or are you remorseful? King David was repentant. If you look at the biblical definition of repentance, it involves at least three things. In my understanding, I have sinned. David said, I transgressed. I committed iniquity. I sinned. In his feelings, when you are repentant, you have a feeling of remorse, of sorrow. David said, my bones feel like they're crushed. In his will, there's a change of mind. David said, instead of committing adultery, instead of murder, instead of sinning and trivializing sin, God, I'm going in a different direction. God, I'm going to teach. God, I'm going to sing. God, I'm going to be a hallelujah. God, I'm coming to you obedient with a broken and a contrite spirit. You see, repentance and remorseful are two totally different things. One is a change of action. The other is, I'm so sorry I got caught. You know what remorse is? You can go home and you can look these folks up in the Bible. Pharaoh said, oh, I've sinned. Balaam said, I've sinned. Achan sinned. Saul said, I've sinned. The rich young ruler went away sorrowful. Even Judah said, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. It's one thing to say I've sinned. It's one thing to have remorse. It's something totally different to repent of your sin. Repentance is a change of action. Remorse is, oh, I got caught. Remorse is, oh, the consequences. So totally different. Are you remorseful or are you repentant over your sin? The last connector point would simply be this. Do you need the restoration of joy? Has the joy of Christianity just leaked out of you? Is it like there's a big gushing wound and joy is just coming out? And it's gone. And we're going through the motion. King David said, Oh God, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Susan Lugelli and her husband today they travel to burn victim units. You know what they do in burn units? They sing and they minister to burn victims. And do you know what she says? Life, quote, life can't get much better. How does that happen? Life can't get much better? Four choices I would leave you with today. Choice number one is will you repent of your sin? Acts 26.20 20 says repentance is proved by our actions. Will you repent? Not will you be remorseful, but will you repent? Choice number two is will you accept Christ as your Savior? As many as received Him, to them He gives the authority to become a child of God. Receiving Christ means I accept the fact that I'm a sinner and God has put my sins on Jesus. And he will see me as the righteousness of Christ. Let me ask you, will you serve with joy? King David said, restore to me the joy of my salvation. And I'm wondering if you would be willing to take that FOI section out of your bulletin. And say, pastor, 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 I want to serve with joy. Week after week after week, I beg you, I beg, every week I beg you. I said, will you give five minutes, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 a week, a month, a year? Will you do something for the cause of Christ through the church? Week after week, week after week, our counters come on Monday. Never, never, never is there something in the office. And I'm asking you, will you display gratitude by serving with joy? Tell me how much time you have, and I'll find something for you. And finally, will you display gratitude? The Apostle Paul said in Philippians 4, 6, Rejoice in the Lord. Always rejoice. Rejoice. How do you rejoice? How does Susan Lugelli rejoice? I'll tell you how she rejoices. 
the most important thing in her life. Her husband, her daughter, and herself were spared in that fire. How could she say him thanks with a grateful heart? Her husband, her wife, her, her daughter. And she were alive. That's how she could rejoice. And God has met your greatest need as well. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. You can be forgiven today, and if you have sinned, you can repent and have a restored relationship with God Almighty. How can we not rejoice when the greatest need of our life has been met? Father, thank you for Jesus, and thank you for your goodness to us. Oh, God, today, we're about to sing this hymn of invitation, Just As I Am. And Father, as we stand and as we sing, it might just be that just as we are, we need to come to this altar and say, God, restore to me the joy of my salvation. We might need to repent of our sins before you. God, we might need to come and accept Jesus as our Savior. God, we need, might need to pray and say, oh God, how would you have me serve you to display my gratitude? Lord, thank you for King David. And thank you, Father, for your spirit that showed us that we can go from our bleakest moments, crossing that forbidden boundary, even to the point of murder, that we can come back and be restored and forgiven. God, this is the message the world needs to hear. It's the message of hope. I pray, God, that you'll draw us to yourself now in Jesus' name. Let's stand, let's come, just as I am, without one foot. You come. Just as